I'm here, Bodhi. Who are you? I'm an echo. Your echo. You woke me up. Why are you down there? Echoes can come to life in this place. N no way. Hey guys and welcome back. So it's been a while since I posted my last video. That was the Expanse review for season 4 and that was around a month ago. A little bit over a month actually. But I'm back and today we're going to be talking lock and key. Now I'm going to be posting multiple videos over the next few days when it comes to lock and key. Because there are a lot of deviations from the comic book story. I mean it did stick to the spirit of the comic books in general. But nonetheless there were a lot of deviations including that ending. The comic book series itself is a self-contained stories by the point that we arrived at at the very end of the series that should have been it. That should have been the ending and there should have been no more stories to tell but Netflix is a business that did a good job out of the first season so they want to have room in order to jumpstart a season 2. And that is exactly what they did by the end of the first season. Now it's pretty obvious that Netflix is hell bent on proving that they can do comics without Marvel, you know post the cancellation of the Marvel series. So they started by giving us the Umbrella Academy and that was good right up there with the best of the Marvel Netflix series. Then they gave us Raising Dion which was good but not really the best. V Wars and October Faction did follow as well, both based on IDW publications just like Lock and Key. Haven't watched the former two myself so I can't really speak to their quality, can't really talk about them, haven't ever even read the underlying comics so yeah I've got nothing to say to those two. However the latter I just finished binging, I've read the comics in the past and I loved it. But over the next two to three videos we've got an entire season to talk about, an ending to explain in comparison to the comic book ending. So without further ado, let's get started and let's go. Speaking of the beginning of the season, Lock and Key does have this feel to it, you know that reminds you of the Netflix production of The Haunting of Hill House and that goes for the entire season. A lot of moments of the season that reminds you of that other Netflix series. However, from the very first moment the locks arriving to the huge house in Madison and even though they've got a lot going on for them, a lot of bad stuff, you know, the death of their father and whatnot, there's this little bit of excitement over how huge this house is, you know, how amazing it is. Just like that very excitement of the Crane kids, the Crane family when they first arrived to Hill House. Now there are a couple of pop culture references right out of the bat. You've got Buzz Lightyear, a reference to the Toy Story series of movies. Phoebe, Chandler and Monica are a reference to the obvious, the hit sitcom Friends. Now the first episode is titled Welcome to Madison, matching in a way with the title of the first volume in the comic book series, Welcome to Lovecraft. The choice of the imaginary town of Lovecraft for the comic book series that was in honor of H.P. Lovecraft whom after the controversy around some of his work ended up being changed to Madison in honor of Richard Madison. Moving on though, the conversation between Kinsey and Tyler about his fights with his father right before his death that matches once again with the same on the pages of the comics even though we do get to know more about that on the source material at a later stage. Sam Lasser on the pages of the comics is part of another flashback, but still one on the first issue and it's one that does tell us as well how Randall Locke died. I don't believe Nina was shot on the pages of the source material, she was sexually assaulted by Al Grubb instead, you know Sam's partner, but otherwise everything else is almost by the book. And Sam Lesser is of course controlled by something stronger than just himself, wanting to know about Key House or to be more precise about the keys and of course where Randall hid them. Now Bodhi on the pages of the source material is the first to discover the well house, the echo that responds in a feminine tone and does not really repeat what you say and the echo we come to know as Dodge. On the pages of the Lock and Key comics though, his mother and uncle are never brought into this part of the story. It is just Tyler and Kinsey and the two of them do react in the negative to his claims just like they did over here. Moving away though from Bodhi for a moment here, the new look with Kinsey, it's not really as noticeable as it was on the pages of the comics, you know the change itself, it was quite the makeover with their change on the pages of the comics. I mean over here it's just paying tribute to the source material with the objective as well for the change being all about wanting to slip unnoticed and unpitied. 
On the premiere as well, we get introduced to Scott Cavendish, that's a deviation from Scott Cavanaugh on the pages of the comic book, in terms of ethnicity as well, which does play a minor role in his relationship with his best friend on the pages of the comics, Jamal Saturday. There's also the deviation when it comes to the lack of existence of Jamal Saturday on the series, the deviation as well when it comes to how he first met Kinsey, which in the comics was right after she threw up, almost threw up on him as well, right out of Ali Whedon's window at school. And finally, there is the deviation with the Jackie character and the lack of the Jordan character. Now speaking of these four on the pages of the comics, I do think that Scott is basically a mashup between Scott and Jamal out of the comic book and Jackie and Eden seem to put together, fill in for both Jackie and Jordan. Eden, even though somewhat good deep inside, does present us at a lot of moments throughout the first season with Jordan's hurtful personality, so yeah, that kind of fits a little bit. Now on another note, Jackie getting hooked up with Tyler at some point down the road on the season does present us with an easter egg to the fact that Kinsey's comic book version did want to hook up her brother with none other than Jackie Veda, her best friend. Sticking with Tyler though, for a moment before I circle back to Bodie, Tyler playing hockey is by the book. His remembering his father, you know, Sam Lesser killing his father and being violent over it, that changing his state of mind, that's also by the book. Back to Bodhi though, he does discover the ghost key before he even gets to have the conversation we do watch him have with Dodge. He does use it and goes around in ghost form for a while. The keys that Dodge describes to him on the very premiere are pretty much in order. The ghost key, the second one, could have been one of many. You know, the one that changes the way you look. There are so many that I could think of over here, there is the skin key, there is the age key, and there is the animal key, and finally there is the gender key. Now the series did not really present us with the animal key on this season, hopefully they would use that on the upcoming season, they really did not present us with any other four keys, but the other three though, they did mash them all up in one key that was made for the series and not part of the comics, the identity key. Finally though, the last key that she does speak of, the one that she needs in order to get out of the well house, that happens to be the anywhere key. Now there are two keys that could be used on that door in the well house, one that got her out and the other one is the echo key, we get to hear about that later on. And in the comics it basically brings someone who's been dead back to life in the well house and makes sure they stay there as an echo. And if they were to step out of the well house, they would disintegrate. And in the comics, that disintegration does feel a lot like the dusting, you know, the Thanos snap kind of dusting. Now Dodge's description of how these keys look, the way they do actually look on the series, that does completely fit with what they look like on the pages of the comics. On the pages of the comics as well, it would be later explained that younger children have always been known to attract and find those keys, more than any other who could actually see the magic that these keys bring, sort of like a fail-safe mechanism. It's all about the innocence of a child Bodhi's age or around Bodhi's age, you know, they're less inclined to use such keys to do harm or to bring any kind of damage upon others. But that's also why young adults forget all about the keys in the Magic and Key House and they also stay that way forever as they venture into adulthood. That ensures the keys would never be used in something like bringing about a war or doing extreme harm to other people, you know, using them for criminal purposes. Now Bodhi finding the anywhere key in the bracelet does not happen this early, does not happen in this fashion or for the reason of going to an ice cream parlor. The key only works if you know where you're going like you've seen it before which is why Dodge at some point tries to get a photo of where he wants to go to kill an older version of Aaron Voss. That's the comic book version and that's what Dodge explains on the series as well. He needed to see her entire room on the pages of the comics along with the door to the room and the number on it. That also explains why it does not work for them when it comes to the top of the Eiffel Tower, you know, Bodhi and Kinsey. They've just never seen the door to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Anywhere key is not really the first key that he finds either because the first key is the ghost key and he does not need to be introduced to the keys by dodging the well house. He does find the ghost key before he meets Dodge to start with. On this episode as well, we've got Kinsey, all furious, kicking Bodhi out. That also applied to the comics, except it was not just Kinsey kicking him out, but also Tyler. 
In the comics, they both thought he was spying on them when he came to tell them, hey, I saw you do this and that, while he was spying on them in ghost form, I was just hovering over you. But circling back to Eden though, we never get enough of Kim Topher out of that comic book, you know, Randall's friend, so we get Eden. Eden is a little bit of a mashup between Jordan, you know, the love interest of Tyler on the pages of the comics, and Kim Topher, Randall's girlfriend. Kim was known to be the beautiful, yet very self-centered and very selfish girlfriend. There was quite a ton of similarities as well over the pages of the comics between both Kim and Jordan, so it's no real surprise over here. Now another deviation from the get-go is Sam Lesser's lack of involvement in Dodger's escape, because in the comics he's just as locked up, but has a bigger role, manages to escape, get to Key House and help Dodge make her escape, even though she then still uses Bodhi in order to help her escape, because then he needed to save his family from Lesser instead of the Mirror. And speaking of the mirror, you know, the key to the prison of the self, the mirror key. That was just one more key created for the purpose of the show and only the show, just like the identity key, that did not exist in the comics. But here though is another easter egg to the comic books, closing the eyes when inside the mirror to avoid getting completely lost, that's inspired by people having to close their eyes when opening the black door in the sea caves, because if not, they do get possessed by those little bullet-like things flying all around, you know, the demons that come from the other side of the door. So in a way, the concept of the mirror key, how to deal with it, how to avoid getting damaged by whatever it brings, that was inspired by the Omega key out of the comic books. Now one more thing to add over here is that their mother was never as involved at this point in the story as she was over here with the mirror key and whatnot. The fact that she doesn't believe any of this, that she forgets it, sticks to the spirit of the comic book. No adult believes in the magic of Key House and that works perfectly with the fact that she did not react to seeing Bodhi's head wide open using the head key on the pages of the source material. Now Lesser does indeed get a visit from Dodge in the comics but not in person, he rather gets the visit from her in more of a telepathic or vision fashion. She befriends Bodhi, she asks Bodhi to bring her scissors, he brings her the scissors, she communicates with Sam Lesser through the water in a sink in his cell and passes him the pair of scissors which he uses in his escape, you know, to kill the guard and take the keys and run out of his imprisonment. But that though brings us to episode 2. Now early on in the second episode we do hear of the lady that went nuts, ended up in the insane asylum after walking into Key House, that would be Erin Voss, and that did happen in the source material not because she ran into Key House, but rather because Dodge used the hat key in order to pull out her memories. Now Bodhi with his toys talking to them is understandable with them being a child and all, but it's more of a trademark of Rufus Whedon, which makes it more exciting that we do see Rufus Whedon later on. We've also got the photo from Randall's past, his high school photo, and that's by the comic book, except the photo on the pages of the comics was more costumed and right out of their roles on the Keepers of the Tempest, and that was their adaptation of Shakespeare's The Tempest for a school play. Now in that play they did use the keys to make it special, give it magical effects and spice it up. Now Ellie's visit to the lots was by the comic book, Lucas standing next to her in the photo I was just speaking about, her boyfriend back then, that was quite the real deal as well. Rufus on the other hand and in the comic book arc is not really adopted, but rather Ellie's biological son, making this one more departure away from the comic book story. Now there are a lot of variations here when it comes to Dodge, events seem to be a bit more spread on the series, introducing us to the chaos that she would bring in a much slower fashion. She does repeatedly use the Anywhere key though in a way similar to how Zack or Lucas or Dodge, so many names, a legion of names, that's what he refers to himself as over the course of the comic book story, but she does do it a lot on the series, just like he does it on the pages of the comics. We do get to see how murder is such a joy for her though, just like it was for her or for Zack on the pages of the comics. On the second episode as well, we do meet Joe Ridgway, who speaks of Lucas, building up to his encounter with Lucas on the pages of the comics. Instead of being Tyler's teacher, though, in present day, he happens to be Kinsey's on the pages of the comics. 
the part about Tyler being called the guidance counselor by other kids, being teased about it, and that impacting his decisions, you know, to stop bad things from happening, one of them to his sister in the past, which he does remember over the course of the comic book story. That's also quite the extra detail that the series did not forget about plugging in there. Now the bit about the claw hammer that also matches up with Nina's role during the flashbacks to the murder of Rendell Locke, we get the talk about the accident in the sea cave, the three friends that drowned, which is very true to the comics. Can't remember who it was on the pages of the comics right off the top of my head right now, but I do think it was Kim Topher, it was Mark Cho and Lucas Carvaggio. But two more and we're done here, we've got Duncan Locke not remembering the death of Lucas Carvaggio. That entire night is all about the head key that we see Bodhi find on this episode. The wiping of those memories of that night, or in other words, the removal and dumping of those memories or hiding of those memories, that's pretty much by the comic book. That's what his older brother did in order to protect him from such scarring memories. Last but not least though, the way the head key works on the series is quite different than what it was on the pages of the source material. You do get the out of the body experience there as well, except your head would be wide open, which did give the out of the body experience reason, like you gotta be able to see inside your head, putting it all in a toy box for Bodhi or behind the door that has significant value for any of the others that use the key over the course of this season, that's pretty much a departure from the comics and does negate the need for that bit. So the only good reason they had to do it on the series was to kind of easter egg what went down on the comics, kind of give it the feel out of the comics. That being said though, this is one out of three or four videos that I'm going to be posting on Lock and Key. There are probably going to be three videos in total and this is the first of them. And on the next video, I'm probably going to be discussing episodes three through six and then on the final video, I'm gonna be heading into the final four episodes of the season. That being said as well, let me know in the comments down below what you thought of the season so far, and if you've watched the entire season, let me know what you thought of the season as a whole. If you've read the comics as well, let me know which you thought was better, the comic book read or the series binge. Let me know as well if you did like this video by dropping it one of those much appreciated likes, subscribing to this channel and make sure while you're at it to enable notifications in order to get updates whenever I upload a new video, publish a new community post or start a new live stream. But until the next time that you tune in for another one of my videos, lock and key or otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in to this video and have a great day.